I'm Alan Cozen, and welcome to Things We Said Today, our weekly show about all things Beatles, their past, present, anything we can find out about the future. And actually, this week we may have something about something in the future. I'm joined by my regular co-hosts, Ken Michaels, who you know is the host of the syndicated radio show, Every Little Thing. Hello, Ken. Hi, Alan. Hi, everybody. And Steve Marinucci, whose work you know from examiner.com as the Beatles examiner, the Monkees examiner, and many other sorts of examiners. Um, hello, Steve. Hello, Alan. Hello, everyone. And Al Sussman, a longtime contributor and, in fact, executive editor of Beatle Fan Magazine. Hello, Al. Hi, Alan. Hello there, everybody. Okay, so um, this week we have a fairly newsy show because uh, in in the week that has elapsed since we last gathered, um, lots of stuff has happened. And so, I mean, bizarrely enough, last week we had a topic that we never got to because – there was so much in the news to talk about that by the time we got to the end of that, the show was over. And um, I think this week the same thing will happen because the list is even longer <laughs> and begins with <laughs> begins with the an announcement uh, today as we record the show uh, of Eight Days a Week, Ron Howard's film about the Beatles touring years. Apple announced that the film – Today would be well, – let me see. First, it would be shown theatrically in September and then immediately go to Hulu for streaming. And they released a 50-second trailer uh, that showed a little bit of what the film is going to be about. And it has caused an uproar naturally among Beatle fans on the internet, on Facebook, and generally around. And uh, so – it obviously falls to us to discuss what it all means. <laughs> so, so Steve, um, you've reported on it uh, in, in your examiner examining. Why don't you tell us what it all means from your point of view? Well, uh, um, most of the details we already knew. The uh, obviously the big thing is that it's going to be it's going to come to America on the sixteenth of September. And then uh, I think it's it's the next yeah the next day it'll show up on Hulu, which for those who don't know Hulu is not really the the uh, streaming outlet I would have chosen because Hulu mm. has commercial commercials, and the thought of that thing having commercials in between it really uh, I hope for some reason I hope it, because it's their new documentary arm that, that maybe they make an exception but. But in any event, that's what's going to happen. It'll it'll premiere in uh, England on the fifteenth, I believe it is. I'm looking at my. Yeah. Uh, there were some rumors going around last week that it would be the twelfth, but it, it's not. It's the fifteenth, unless there's a another, um, you know, unless there's another screening. But it it did say in the premiere it would be an all star premiere uh, on the 15th in England and then it's going to premiere uh, you know on several several dates up through that week I think the 22nd is is the last one and yeah the 22nd is the last one in Japan so um, but it's going to it's going to premiere pretty much all that week and it's going to be it's going to have uh, you know li uh, uh, a new live material I think people were really excited about the fact that they had asked for a lot of a lot of uh, fan footage, and um, I think I'm not going to comment on that because uh, we've been talking about that. But one thing I did hear from somebody who has seen a um, an advanced version is that Pete Best and Jimmy Nickel are not in it at all, which is interesting. So but, that means no footage from a certain part of the 1964 tour, for mm, one thing. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I don't think there was there, there wasn't footage of them with Pete Best, except for that little floral hall 1962 yeah. thing. But um, but yeah, Jimmy Nickel is in. Um, you know, there there is quite a lot of footage that has him in it from mm -hmm. Holland and uh, uh, even even Australia. Uh, Australia, uh, yeah. Australia too. First couple yeah, of that, dates, yeah. Right, and that Holland footage is 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 some of the best footage there is, and yeah. so is the Aust and the Australia footage is good too. And that's yeah. really really a shame if that's 
if that's true. I mean, As a matter of fact, actually, in the trailer, um, I believe they show a clip of Australia, um, the, you know, not them playing, but where they're sort of in, uh, I guess, the mayor's residence or something, and there's a huge throng of people outside. So Jimmy Nickel mm. is probably in there microscopically. <laughs> we may not mm. get to see him. But, okay. Uh, but, yeah, that's, I mean, that's interesting. But it's going to, I mean, it's 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 going to be, fun it's gonna be on the big screen i mean the thing that's interesting to me is number one it's only going to be not and you know around 90 minutes which is leaves out a whole lot of history and it's certainly not going to be there's not going to be a lot of full concerts in there um which you know maybe at some point down the road they when they release it on dvd the the expanded version will be otherwise and um so that's that's interesting um most you know, documentaries and, are that way. Yeah. And, and in right. fact, you don't really get complete songs very often. So. Right. Yeah. Right. And which, which it, it's going to be interesting exactly how they, how they went with this thing, how they, I mean, I, the fact that Ron Howard is involved, you know, an Oscar winner, somebody who knows what he's doing, it's going to, I'm, I'm curious to see where he took this and what they did, you know, how they handled it. That's going to be what's, what's going to be interesting. Apparently there is some new footage, and apparently the quality is is going to be astounding. But well, you, you know. can see that bit of the Manchester footage um, that oh, yeah. really I've never seen it look like that. I mean, yes. that is just incredible. So mm -hmm. that would be that would be nice to see. Although I believe it is synced to the studio recording of Twist and Shout. Yeah, which is I noticed up. that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's, that's yeah. interesting. Yeah, yeah. it's the, the fact that it's going to be almost immediately uh, debuting on on Hulu is interesting because I remember saying a few months back that I thought possibly they might go with with uh, Netflix, you know, as a you know a possible and bypass a theater a theater run. So so it's it's interesting that they're just going to have you know basically a few of these I guess what you might call theater events. Mm -hmm. And then the next day, the day after the first of those events, uh, it'll be immediately shown on uh, on Hulu. And um, I don't know. It's possible that if one has Hulu Plus, I'm not sure of this because I don't have either Hulu or Hulu Plus at this point. But I think on Hulu Plus, I think uh, they may not. Uh, go with commercials. I'm not sure. No, no, no that's how it works because we have Hulu. Okay. The basic, the basic Hulu comes with commercials. If you want okay. it without com without commercials, you have to pay four dollars more a month. Right, and that's Hulu Plus. Well, no, it's called Hulu Plus. I don't. I'm not sure why it's why oh. it's it's, oh. it's it's just it's just another it's a without commercials option. We've oh, had I see. For for over a year and. When we first got it, you didn't have that option, and then they added it in about six months ago. Uh, so I don't know what I yeah, and it's really it's it. I mean, I was I was thinking that they would run the film in the theater for a week or two before they threw it on Hulu. I was really surprised when they when they said it was going to be the next day. I mean, I don't know. It kind of strikes me as the kind of film that really. You know, because since it is just a 90 minute documentary, it doesn't really seem to be the kind of film that would run in, you know, in mainstream theaters. No, oh, I, I, just, I, just, I disagree. Michael Moore's, to use Michael Moore as an example, Michael Moore's documentaries run for, you know, a week at least. And, and, and well, that's a little different because he's got a specific. You know, kind of political agenda in mind. This is really just, uh, you know, it's really just a piece of nostalgia, you know. Mm, but and it's also it, and it just and it, and it just doesn't. It doesn't seem like the kind of thing that would run for a week or two in movie theaters. So that's why it's I, it's it may it seems to make more sense to have these, you know, just these sort of event premieres. And then have it immediately go to you know a streaming service and and then on demand and whatever. Maybe well, they felt the demand wasn't there, but I would have I would have said it you know I would have thought at least a week. That would have been my that mm. would have been my my decision. Al, um, um, Ken, how often do you ever see a documentary on any rock band in a movie theater? 
Exactly. And, uh, you know, obviously this is just for a limited run, limited theaters. And I wouldn't expect it to run more than a week. But, yeah, Mm -hmm. it's a little bit surprising the day after to be on Hulu. But Mm -hmm. um, I would think um, by making it available on Hulu, that's going to drum up demand for it on DVD and Blu-ray. You'd also have to hope that uh, maybe there'll be more material on the DVD and Blu-ray that won't be (laughs) on Hulu and in the theaters. And, Um, and And Hulu isn't the, you know, in terms of... The streaming services, Netflix is the biggest one. Why they yeah. didn't go? Th- yeah. That's another question. Why they didn't go with net with Netflix? Right. I mean, we have. I don't know if you guys have Netflix and Hulu. We have both of them, and I like Netflix much better than Hulu, much better. Mm. So, I don't know. Could be just you know whatever have you know, however much uh, as they say, cashish was right. <laughs> was offered to Apple. Yeah. I'm, I, yeah. yeah. Well, well, they also uh, Hulu's also rolling this out as the first their first part of their new documentary uh, uh, arm, and I mean that may have had something to do with it. But still, Netflix is the is the better service. I mean, even you know you wouldn't want to see it on Amazon Prime because Amazon Prime really isn't as classy. Although, I mean, um, Hulu has some great stuff. I'm not gonna. You know, they have Dick Cavett. They have a lot of old TV shows. They have, I mean, they have some really good stuff there. Uh, there's no mm-hmm. question. But uh, I'm just surprised that they um, they went with Hulu over Netflix. It would, I think Netflix would have made a lot more sense. I mean, Netflix has the Wrecking Crew right now. They have, you know, uh, they have Frida, uh, good old Frida. So, mm-hmm. I'm, you know, I don't know. Well, know. Hulu has Seinfeld, right? So it's probably because of that. So does <laughs> somebody, yeah. So guys, um, Go ahead. you know, one of the things that we had originally heard was, I mean, this was originally pitched as a documentary that would show us lots of material from the touring years. And now it looks more like, um, you know, we're going to see from what we can see from the trailer It's going to be Paul telling us that they were all friends and stuff that um, most of us may have known, um, (laughs) stuff like that. And and, and so people who've been complaining about it on the uh, Internet have been saying, you know, it looks like sort of a rehash of anthology. Mm -hmm. And from what people um, who've been close to the project have said various places very guardedly – the project really did change over the time it's been in the process, that it was going to be mostly a music film, and now it's kind of a documentary with lots of music, but still a documentary with lots of talking, too. So what do you feel about that? It sounds like, uh, certainly from your description, it sounds like the same thing happens happened with this film with Ron Howard that happened with Marty Scorsese and living in the material world. Interesting. Mm, no, mm. I don't think you so. know, because, you know, because there, you know, uh, people, one of the biggest complaints that people have had about, uh, about that film was it's incompleteness. Right. The fact, yeah, the fact that, uh, and that it, and then that it did turn out to be a lot more in the way of, uh, you know, kind of a Greek chorus of talking heads, uh, that kind of thing, you know, much like the anthology, than a, you know, a really music intensive film. And it, you know, it appears that, uh, that they're, you know, that again, the, you know, the, the the principles at uh, at Apple uh, may have had a role in changing you know the direction of of actually both films. Actually, mm-hmm. I, I, I wouldn't I, compare those two at all. Living in the material world, I think car- what they covered they covered well and in detail. But I really mm-hmm. think that while nobody will admit it, they had a deadline to meet, and um, mm-hmm. because of that, once you got to the '74 George tour. And then a cut to the traveling Wilburys. <laughs> mm-hmm, it's like, yeah. you know, it shows right there that I really think that, um, you know, probably to meet the demands of the deadline, they didn't cover all the time in between. But what they did cover, they covered well. Um, I would reserve judgment on this 
uh, Beatles film until we see yeah. it. But, sure. you know, yeah. it, it is always the tendency with Apple to mainstream everything. And just mm. like, you know, we talked about Pure McCartney, which to me is for the casual fan, mm. I think that they... They are thinking about that too, and probably they, the Beatles, Apple, Paul, Ringo, the wives, probably think that if all you do is put in unreleased film footage, it's really only going to appeal to the hardcore fan. So they're probably mixing a lot of stuff that we've seen already, probably a lot of stuff that's in the anthology, with some unreleased stuff. It's a balance of the two. I hope there's a decent balance, so uh, that will be the deciding factor as to whether or not, you know, I really like it. <laughs> well, well, the question really is what what they had to work with. I mean, they you you know, mm. I mean, we all know that they had put out a call for for uh, fan footage and unreleased footage, and and you know, we don't know exactly what they had gotten. And I think if they had found, if they had gotten enough really good footage and had used it, I think it would have appealed to both mainstream and uh, hardcore. And again, you know, we can't. You're right. We can't judge this until we've seen it. And I know that some people on Facebook have been doing that all day today, based on right. the trailer, based on a, yeah, which is really kind of silly. Mm -hmm. And and but, um, you know, I, it's hard to say, you know, exactly where they where they've gone with this and and how, you know, if they've done a, a poor job or what. I mean, like I said, Ron Howard is somebody who knows what he's doing. And so I would, and I think that's one of the reasons why they gave it to him. As far as living in the material world goes, I thought, I thought that that was great. As far as I, I really didn't expect a music intensive portrait of, of George that music intensive. I figured it was going to be kind of what there was going to be a lot of words because it was supposed to be more of a spiritual portrait of George more than more than anything else. Um, you know, so I, I I didn't really have any issue, uh, a whole lot of issue with living in the material world at all. Uh, I mean, I will agree with what Ken said about the way they they cut, you know, the 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 editing there and how it was kind of bumpy. But I mean, I still mm. I still still liked it. I thought it was good. I thought they did a good job. What what's interesting is how long that is and how short this is. You know, so I don't know. You know, that's weird. Yeah. Living in the material world, to me, spent way too much time on George's Beatle years, and it would have been much more fascinating to explore so much that we may not know about his solo period. But, um, yeah, it's so obvious once you jump from Dark Horse, the tour, to the Traveling Wilburys, there's mm. all that time in between. And in fact, to even go to the Traveling Wilburys without even mentioning Cloud Nine was yeah. pretty ridiculous because, you know, Jeff Lynne was the start of all that. And you know, right. Jeff Lynne's success with Cloud9 leading to the Traveling Wilburys. I mean, it's just it, they must have had time constraints. And when you're dealing with uh, a, a documentary on someone who's done so much in his lifetime, it's impossible to cover all of it. But if you if you are given as much time as you need to do it right, it, it could have been done right. But what they did cover, they did well up through 74. You yeah. know, and then, you know, it's just that huge hole in between. <laughs> I mean, there might also, you know, with the obvious exception of Cloud9, um, which did produce a number of videos and, and interviews and things, there might not have been all that much footage from between 1974 and 1987 mm -hmm. that could have run into that as a problem, you know, because he, he you know, he kind of stopped doing the normal promotional stuff for a while. Right. He would just put out an album, not tell anybody, <laughs> you know, and... Uh, and then still, do the next one, maybe. There's still stuff you can find, whether it's performances, Saturday Night Live. Yes. Yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. Interviews yeah. with people who were involved with that documentary. Those interviews really helped to make that documentary. And it, yeah. it gave you a full explanation of the many sides of George Harrison, who was a very yeah. complex mm. person. And I think it really succeeded in that way. Mm. With the with the Ron Howard film, I, what I've... what. I've always wondered all this time is that, you know, how much really good quality new material could there be? Because you're, we're talking about it's five decades ago and the technology of that time is just is not what it is now that, you know, that, uh, you know, any 
any film, any private film that would have been done would have been just, you know, eight millimeter film that fans would have shot at, at the concerts. And after a while, there's, you know, there's only so much of that that can be really interesting. So that may, that may account for the fact that the film is only an hour and a half long, that there may well, just... There, mm-hmm. There's a few things. I mean, first of all, there is actual professional footage that has not been widely seen. Um, mm-hmm. I've seen I've seen a little bit of it, and it's um, astonishing quality. Uh, things from say Germany in 1966 that mm-hmm. have never been um, bootlegged even. And with the fan footage, I mean, what they've done uh, is they 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 have the technology to sort of smooth that footage out, make it run at a consistent speed, and dub sound onto it, and and so. It may not be as bad as we imagine it, you know, having having gotten in, in trades over the years yes. with bits of eight millimeter footage. It looks awful. You don't yeah. want to see it. Sure. Um, but when it's processed and, you know, using current technology, uh, you can actually make something of it. But, I mean, there's another way of looking at this. I mean, we're talking about how you know, casual fans may not care about all the unreleased stuff. And the the fact is the casual fans don't know what's been released and what hasn't been released. Mm -hmm. And, and there are, you know, just the things that we know that have been traveling around. There's the full 1963 Swedish show. There's, Mm -hmm. uh, there's Shea. There's the Paris 1965 show, which is fantastic. Yes. Um, mm-hmm. There's footage from there's Budokan. there's lots of yeah. There's there's the two Budokan shows. There's lots of footage, uh, you know, news footage from all over the place where they were allowed to shoot at least one song or so. Um, there's the Hollywood Bowl where there is footage from every single song they played. Sometimes not complete songs but there's something from every song they played there's australia um which was broadcast and is around in fantastic quality so if you're a casual fan if you really are just a casual fan you probably haven't seen most of this stuff Mm -hmm. so Mm -hmm. you know i mean there's there's plenty to work with from that point of view if you're talking about casual fans and if you're a casual fan and they throw in something that hasn't been released you definitely haven't seen that Mm-hmm. So, right. you know, I, I don't see that the, that 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 distinction is necessarily that important. I mean, anything that a hardcore fan would like. I mean, unless we're we're we're, we're not talking about hardcore fans that will want to see any badly processed piece of junk. We're yeah. talking about wanting to see really good, fresh footage that we haven't seen. And I would think that that would appeal to casual fans too, because they don't know what what the choices are. Well, unless you talk to Paul or Ringo or the powers that be, you're not going to know what their thought process is on any project that they put out, whether they're thinking casual or hardcore. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. But it's always been my opinion that they never cared about the hardcore fans. So. No, they don't. Um, and but what I'm saying is that you know you could you could do something that the hardcore fans would love that the casual fans would love too. Mm-hmm. From the reports that have the reports that have filtered out of there, um, you know, a little warily, or that um, the powers, as you say, kind of decided that pe- you know normal people who aren't hardcore fans, I guess, uh, really don't want to see a whole stream of. Beatles concert performances and I kind of wonder what the hell they're thinking <laughs> you know hmm. I mean that was what the project was that was the whole idea right. of the mm-hmm. project yeah hmm. yeah anyway. I mean is you know right I mean well but what what's the alternative then more and more of this fan footage well I mean look they could even give us extremely high quality footage of the stuff that we have like we're going to see with the Manchester footage or oh, you know, sure. we know yeah. what they have of Shea and you know right. and some of this professional footage that hasn't leaked out that someone got their hands on and kept you know hoarded um, over the years and a few collectors have and some of them I know have given it to Apple so there is that but um, yeah Anyway, I, I guess it's you know I just I guess it's a matter of trying to strike a balance between having a 
again, a music intensive film and a documentary which really tells the story of what those live years were, you know, were all about. Yeah. I mean, and that's we don't even know. We have no idea what the interviews are like. But there's also the question of if they're going to tell us about the live years, are they going to really tell us about the live years? Because, you know, I mean, the the one thing I liked about Bob Spitz's book was that it really captured the intense boredom that they felt while being captured, basically, you know, kept in a hotel room, not able to do the, you know, or, you know, having to be at these parties where they're sort of locking themselves in a room and just hanging out. And, you know, I I can understand that. I mean, that that might Mm -hmm. be what it really was like, not the glamorous stuff that we imagine. And I kind of doubt that that's the story they will want to tell. Yeah, I doubt that very much. Yeah. Yeah. So... Yeah. Well, we'll we'll report further when we finally get to see this in September. And uh, any anything else to say about it, or should we move on to the next on the list? I just, I just hope that at some point the concerts that we've mentioned that we know exist, you know, Shea Stadium, Washington Coliseum, you know, Japan, those those should come out in their entirety as separate releases. They and really to should. Me, to me, like you were saying, Alan, I don't really, I don't really see this big blur between the casual and the hardcore where these releases are concerned. Because if you're a new fan, if you're a, if you're a teenager just getting into the Beatles and you're buying their catalog, are you really going to be bored watching the Shea Stadium concert in its entirety? Yeah, you know? no way. <laughs> I don't. I don't really see how that's really thought of as hardcore. So, um, yeah. you know. But like I said, who knows what their thought process is. Unless we get to ask them, or somebody asks them, we won't know. you know, Because this, this applies to every project that ever comes out on them. Yeah. Right. And, if, and, and of course, if you ask them about the Washington Coliseum, they can actually, technically, they can say, hey, it's out. You yeah. know, because it is right. available on iTunes, but you have to buy the whole... Um, you know the the stereo, I guess either the stereo or the mono box, or the digital version of the stereo and mono uh, uh, box to get the uh, the Washington Coliseum show. Well, that should right. just come out. That should just come out on DVD. Period. Yes, ab- absolutely. It really ought to. Yeah. I mean, that's a a fantastic show, and it's in fantastic quality. And, yes. And yeah. It's, so it's, yeah, it's that bre- should be top of their list. It's breathtaking. You know, when, mm-hmm. I, when I did see it, when I streamed it, uh, I just couldn't believe how bright it was and crisp it was. And even if I've seen it a hundred times before that, to see it this way, you know, mm-hmm. your, your eyes are just glued. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yep. So moving on, um, we come to what is really unfortunately becoming an almost weekly feature. If we played music on the show, you would hear strains of Barbara's adagio sort of, you know, creeping up and and that is we have two more Beatles world related deaths um Henry McCullough uh, first first lead guitarist in Wings and Chip Smoman who worked briefly with Ringo uh, on an album that was never released mm. um and so Ken is our I guess resident absolute wings fanatic i guess maybe al al qualifies mm. for that too but, um yeah. nah <laughs> what uh, do you have any thoughts on henry and his contributions to wings well yeah i mean i love all the different lineups of wings through the years and i think if you really studied them you can probably pick out the styles and and uh mm-hmm. be able to differentiate between henry and and jimmy mcculloch and lawrence juber as lead guitarists if you want to but um sure. You know, it's always brought up the the lead guitar solo in My Love, Mm -hmm. which uh, was made up on the spot and uh, was just done done spontaneously. And, you know, every now and then you come across a a lead guitar solo in a song that's so much a part of the song that you can't even imagine hearing it another way. And what he brought to My Love was just that. It was just, you know, it's just something that happened on the spot, just like that, as, as Paul has said. So it was something yeah. magical, and um, it's kind of like if you think about a lead guitar solo like what George Harrison did in Something. I mean, I can't mm-hmm. hear anybody else do a, uh, a solo differently and think of it the same way, what George Harrison brought to that song and that solo, 
really made that song even more special. So I think what Henry did on that song was the same thing. And enough yeah. so that Paul has brought that up many times in interviews. But um, the fact that he was there at the very beginning of when the group was formed, although he wasn't there for Wildlife. Right. He came along, well, the first release really was Give Ireland Back to the Irish, the single. So right. he was on the three singles of 1972 with um, Mary Had a Little Lamb, for which he played mandolin. And mm -hmm. um, he was on High, 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 and then uh, Red Rose Speedway, and Live and Let Die. And um, as a matter of fact, I should also just take this moment to say that I did an interview with Henry, um, which you can actually listen to on my website on the homepage. And he talks about his time with Wings and uh, when he left the group, for which he said he had a big argument with Paul, mm -hmm. although he wouldn't go into detail about it. But um, Henry and Denny Sywell left at the same time, right before Paul and Linda and Denny went to Lagos, Nigeria. Really bad timing on their part, because uh, mm. you know, Band on the Run became the most successful album of Paul's career, Wings' career, mm -hmm. you know. And, uh, you know, when Henry looked back at his time with Paul, uh, with me, he was telling me his frustration in dealing with Paul because, you know, when he was with them, uh, Paul had very definite ideas of how he wanted his songs to sound. And he right. wouldn't let you to stray from that. And even mm -hmm. though Henry came up with that solo on My Love, which Paul has praised time and time again, even after that, he was still pretty much the same way. So, you know, when you want to learn about the history of Wings and was it really a band, and I've been fortunate enough now to interview Henry, Denny Sywell, Denny Lane, Lawrence Duber, and Steve Holly, you get different perspectives from all of them. Right. I wish I could have interviewed Joe English, who is still with us, but, you know, he's part of a... Uh, religious sect mm. these days and uh, oh, he's hard to I get see. a hold of and he doesn't really want to talk about those days anyway yeah. so uh, unless Paul talks about the Wings days in detail which he never really does um, yeah. uh, he won't really know you know what it was like for everyone in the band everyone has their own take of whether or not there was a lot of contributions from all the members Denny Sywell had told me in an interview that he thought that uh, it was very much a band effort. According to Henry, yeah. it wasn't. So, mm -hmm. you know, you hear from everybody. Mm -hmm. Lawrence Duber, on the other hand, was, was thought that uh, Paul was very fair to him. Yeah. Paul was someone who, I just wanted to say, uh, you know, if, if Paul had a definite idea of how he wanted a song to sound, and Lawrence thought of something else, and he brought it to Paul, and Paul liked right. it, he would go with it. So yeah. maybe he was more rigid in the early days of Wings. Well, so I don't know. Henry's, Henry's problem was that once Paul settled on a way a song goes, and including the solo, is that it, it had to be played the same every night. And Henry was apparently a sort of more off-the-cuff kind of guy, and his mm. solo on night two might not be the same as the solo on night one, and Paul didn't like that. He wanted that kind of consistency of mm -hmm. every night, play the same notes. Right. Which um, he pretty much still does. Right. Yeah, he does. Um, I, yeah, I can, I can, you can see that. When you read, when you read about this being um, one of Henry's problems, and I, I, I spoke to Denny Sywell as, as well, and he pretty much confirmed that, that Henry was a, a more uh, organic player is the term mm -hmm. he uses, and that that was one of the issues. I mean, there were other issues, too, with that version of, of Wings, which is that, um, you know, basically Paul did want it to be a band. Um, and as you say, Denny, Denny Sywell talks about it being a band. He talks about how, you know, they all made contributions. They all, you know, Paul listened to them. They had a say mm -hmm. in, in, in lots of things. But on the other hand, you know, he did have them on salary and mm. it was kind of um, not what they originally thought they were getting into. And some of the financial frustrations sort of boiled over for Henry at the same time as the musical frustrations. And he just quit um, with Denny Sywell. I, I think, you know, he had argued with Paul that, um, you know, if couldn't we put off going to Lagos for a month? Lagos and mm. <laughs> uh, get another guitarist, break him in and then go make that album. And Paul kept saying, no, we're going to do it the way we did Ram. We're just going to 
you know, multi-track and overdub and that'll be fine. And, you know, and then too, the combination of the financial frustrations. And in this case, this was the musical frustration for him is sort of why he quit. You know, he quit a few weeks after um, Henry McCulloch, actually. But um, yeah, you know, that that was it was a really interesting lineup of wings because it was the first lineup. And it was, you know, they were here was Paul trying to get a band together for the first time since the Beatles. And, um, Mm. you know, and, and Henry was a real interesting player, apparently a bit of a brawler. But, um, you know, that's that's it. He was a very important part of why that early version of Wings was so distinctive. So, Al? You know, as a matter of fact, yesterday I heard Andre Gardner play uh, the instrumental track. Actually, it's really just, just Henry's solo mm. on uh, High, High, High. You know, mm. just, just his, you know, isolated guitar parts. And he was a, you know, a very... You know, I guess for that for that time, what you would call a hot guitarist, mm-hmm. you know, maybe not in the league of a, you know, an Alvin Lee or, you know, certainly a Clapton or a Hendrix, but certainly one of those, you know, those uh, those guitarists who who really could, you know, improvise and and really, you know, really add a lot to a particular track. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And in fact, right before he joined Wings, he was in, he was in Joe Cocker's Grease Band. Yes. Right. right. And he you know, even he... played on stage at Woodstock. Right. That's right. Band, so. right. He also was on the uh, original version of Jesus Christ Superstar. Yes, that's true. Hmm. I, I also interviewed Henry, and uh, the one thing that came away from that was how nice a guy he was. He was in, he, Ken, and Ken, I, I mm-hmm. suspect, probably agree he was an incredibly Mm. nice guy he really really was in fact i remember um getting some comments after i wrote up my interview and uh, some people had questions about what i had written and they or they had another question for him and they wanted to know if i would go back and ask him and i did and and he answered and that was really i mean that's not something that people will musicians will generally do but Mm -hmm. he did he did it and and i mean he was in england when he when i when i I talked to him by phone in england and he was he was just an incredibly nice guy an incredibly nice guy and one other thing i want to bring up having interviewed both henry and denny sywell is that i really got a sense that apart from the fact that yes they were in a band with someone of the stature of paul mccartney this really was a family affair Mm-hmm. And they were really close during that two-year period when they were all together, mm-hmm. being on the road a lot, <laughs> spending a lot of time at the farm in Scotland. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't just a band. It was very much like a family. And I think that certainly, you know, when I spoke to Denny and, and to Henry, it, it, it was also, they, there was a bit of sadness there because yeah. they missed that feeling of, of family and unity and closeness that they had. You know, spending so much time every day together. There's a yeah. there's a there's a great clip on YouTube of Henry and Denny playing together at the fest that is worth yeah. uh, looking looking at. But on but also mm-hmm. the the comments that came out after Henry passed from both Denny and Paul. Paul actually made reference to my love, which. Mm-hmm. As far as I'm concerned, I mean that's pretty unusual for him to do that, and he actually did it. And I think that was that's worth noting right there that uh, he had a lot. In fact, he uh, he actually uh, Henry told me that he and and you guys probably remember hearing about this is that he acknowledged him from the audience in in I believe it was Scott when he played Edinburgh. Yes, mm-hmm. yes, you're right. And and uh, yeah, and that I mean that's not something that Paul. I mean, Paul does. It just he doesn't do that, and so he had it. He respected Henry a lot. He really did, and so yeah, that was uh, that was really cool to yeah. That. A couple so, of other yeah. things. Um, when Henry was at the Fest for Beatle fans in 2012, he was there in part to promote a new CD at the time, right? Sh- right. Shabby Road, which he recorded mm-hmm. with Danny Sywell, and it's all Beatle covers. Mm-hmm. So it's a really good album, and also he actually had an album on Dark Horse Records. 
right. That's right. right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, mind dark. your own business. Right. Mm-hmm. And he also did, he also actually when I interviewed him, it was to promote his own CD called Unfinished Business. <laughs> um, yeah. So. Um, but yeah, I remember the Shabby Road one because I got that I got that from Denny Sidewell, um, and it's actually a very nice very nice album. So, so um, Steve, yes, um, what do you what can you tell us about Chip's Moment? Not a whole lot, other than the fact that that uh, um, that Moment, as I recall, because I didn't I did not write about Moment's passing. Um, mm-hmm. but Moment worked brief worked with Ringo on some sessions. That did not get released, and and I believe they leaked out, and they weren't met with a lot of good comments. I think that was a bad period for Ringo. Um, yeah, that was yeah. pretty much the, the end of his sort of drinking period. And yeah, the, it's never been clear whether his dissatisfaction was with Moments Production or his own contributions. Um, I, 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 I asked him I, about him once, and he he kind of didn't even want to talk about it. I believe I heard some of that stuff, and it wasn't very good. It I really was. But do you yeah. have it? I have some of it. There was a bootleg that came out years ago called "Lost and Found," right. and it was yeah. half half songs from the album that Ringo made with Chip's Moment. And it's not the whole album. It's, it's you know it's about five I, songs, um, mm-hmm. and then the other half is all uh, different mixes of Cloud Nine. George Harrison yeah. stuff, but the songs mm-hmm. that he recorded with Chips, he covered "I Can Help." The uh, mm-hmm. Swan song, which right. you know, <laughs> I wanted to bring this up to you guys uh, when I heard about Chip's moment passing. But many years back, before I think before the Chip's moment sessions with Ringo, somebody said to me, "Did you ever think that I can help?" Sounds like Ringo singing, and I never thought about it all that much. But if you listen, it does sound a bit Ringo-ish. That song. It might have been, you know what? It may have been a, in a conversation that you and I and Tom Frangione had, possibly on one of the one of the guest shots we did on your show on DHA. It's possible. Yeah. I do recall us talking about it, at the, uh, you know, during that time. Hmm. But and you, yeah, with with Ringo's <laughs> uh, penchant for for country music, and that song uh, was not only a number one pop hit but a number one country hit. Right, or Billy Swan. It's it was something I I could just hear him do, and I've heard the recording of it. It's not that great. <laughs> he right. also yeah. he also covered um, "You Better Move On," the um, Arthur Alexander song, which the Stones right. covered. Um, mm-hmm. And there's a song called "Hard Times," which is not the same one that Ringo did on "Bad Boy." And there's even um, on the bootleg, there's some of the court conversation. <laughs> right. Mm. Uh, yeah. So. Uh, yeah, and I have read online that originally Ringo planned on recording three albums with Chips. Yeah. So, uh, you know, that fell apart. I, I guess, like you said, Alan, we don't know if it's because Ringo was, wasn't happy with his performance or with Chips' production. But, um, you know, from what I've heard, what's been bootlegged, it, it's not that great. <laughs> right. It really isn't. So once he cleaned up right. his act, everything changed from it right. takes time on. He was, you know... Yeah, I, I have a, yeah. I have a feeling that you know the court case might have sort of colored his view of those sessions and and not wanting to sort of revisit that time in his life may have colored his view of the sessions and you know what we heard on the bootleg is obviously not finished and uh, who knows what the the finished thing would have been but um, but yeah I mean the idea of an unreleased Ringo album I, I'm not sure if he did he actually finish the album or, or was it just I, I, no I I'm think it. Sure. Uh, yeah, it was yeah. Uh, kind of fell apart. Yeah, you know, because of the fact that he was he was at that time, like you say, he was really at just about the 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 bottom of his period of uh, substance abuse. It wasn't that long before he and Barbara went into uh, uh, yeah. went into re- into rehab. Exactly, I'm, and I'm, and ta- and and talking about Chip's moment, uh, you know, it's not. You know, not Beatles connected, but he did a lot of great work in the 60s. You know, early on, uh, he was very much involved with the early years of Stax, mm-hmm. uh, and he was very involved with the uh, the Memphis and Nashville R&B community during the mid the mid 60s. And perhaps greatest of all, 
he was the producer of those incredible sessions that Elvis Presley did uh, in Memphis in the early weeks of 1969 in the afterglow of the the, the 68 comeback TV special that mm-hmm. produced uh, that produced one of my all time favorite albums by anybody from mm-hmm. Elvis in Memphis uh-huh. and mm-hmm. and also the follow up album and and in fact those sessions produced Elvis's last number one record. Right. Mm-hmm. Sus- mm-hmm. Suspicious Minds. Yeah. And also yeah. on that album was In the Ghetto. <laughs> yes, mm-hmm. absolutely. And, and Kentucky Rain. Mm-hmm. So, yep. Yeah. And also, Here's, since I just want to say for, for yeah. anyone that follows me on Facebook, one of my favorite singers ever <laughs> is B.J. Thomas. Yes. And um, Schiff's Moman worked with him and, and produced Hooked on a Feeling. Uh-huh. Uh, as yeah. well as uh, I just can't help believing, and um, hey, won't another, play another somebody yeah. done somebody mm-hmm. wrong yep. song, which he, yeah. which he co-wrote. So he did mm-hmm. a lot of great work, and he founded American Sound Studios. In that yes, show. right, right. So I, he, I have another couple of uh, titles uh, from those moment sessions. He did some kind of wonderful. I don't know if I can imagine Ringo doing that. Um, B Patrol, ain't that a shame? And Shooby Dooby Doo Da Day. Oh, and whiskey and soda. Ah, right. You know, it's funny, uh, Chip's moment. I mean, we, if if you're focused solely on the Beatles, you sort of just know about those right. sessions that were failures. But, you know, Chip's moment was a major guy, and it's in a way kind of a shame that they never were able to um, to make that happen, you know. I mean, mm-hmm. it, was a great, it was a great idea at some point. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, sometimes chemistry doesn't work and sometimes there are other things, but, uh, you know, oh, well, that will, we'll probably never see, uh, hear any of those songs in an official version because, um, Ringo seems not to want to even think about them and, um, probably mm. can't. Believe. Right. But, right. So we have another thing from Steve, which is, uh, his report on, uh, the Tony Sheridan sessions and new documents that have turned up that sort of rewrite, uh, what we knew about those sessions, at least contractually. <laughs> so, well, you, uh, uh, Thorsten Knobloch, uh, uh, sent, uh a German Knobloch, author who specializes author. in, you know, mm-hmm. Beetle Research, yeah, um, sent me the information that the contract that uh, Sheridan, um, the contracts uh, that we thought the Beatles had with Tony Sheridan were not as as we thought uh, they were, and in fact he said that the uh, there were two songs, um, and I got to look at it now because uh, this is an extremely long article. Um, but there were two songs that they recorded that they were not paid for, and in f- and and somebody asked uh, or somebody uh, suggested online, you know, what about Tony? What about Pete Best? And I saw for a fact that he that Newblock actually told Rogue Best about this, so mm-hmm. they they know um, they do know, but. Uh, you know, uh, I don't know if it's going to mean a whole lot of, you know, it's not going to mean a whole lot of money, but yeah. it's 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 interesting that this information has come out. It, it brings up some other, you know, little just little sideline details like, you know, mm. if 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 Thorsten is correct and uh, it looks from reading his piece like he is um, and they weren't contracted to Polydor uh, at, at the time they made those discs they were just session men then i mean one of the things he points out is that the implications for epstein having to get them out of that contract so they can record for emi sort of change you know Mm -hmm. but basically they they were signing something that they couldn't read it was in german um and so they really didn't know what they were signing and And they were also they were also not 21 that's right so that was the other thing. So the the contract, anything they signed wouldn't have been valid. If if I understood, if I remember it correctly, I mean, he was saying that they subsequently signed a contract um, with Polydor or Camford, I think Polydor, that mm-hmm. was um, after they recorded with Tony Sheridan. That what they have as documentation of the Tony Sheridan sessions is really just a receipt mm-hmm. for being paid as session men. Right. 
And it's really, you know, it's really kind of weird. I mean, just about history and documents and stuff. You know, at the time, they were handed these things and everybody knew what they were. Now, you know, 60 years later or more, you know, we, we mm. look at these documents and we say, okay, what were these? What does this mean? What is this about? Mm. Yeah. You know, what were the circumstances? And it's it's kind of funny because it's not that long ago. It's not like the, you know, reign of Henry III or something. Mm-hmm. You know? So, although yeah. in the pop culture world, it's actually a lifetime ago. That's true. Because you know, because imagine that happening with with any group now. Yeah, yeah. Right, right. Mm. So, yes, does anyway. Kanye sign German contracts that he can't read? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. There we go. Okay, so that was the Tony Sheridan item. Um, there was also the business of we we I think just want to mention that Love is out there streaming. Uh, the Beatles released love. the Beatles Love. You know, within the past week, uh, was just released for streaming with I believe the two tracks that were iTunes right. exclusives mm-hmm, when it mm-hmm. yeah. came out. So how do you I think, how do you how do you guys feel about that uh, about that album? I actually like it. Yeah, yeah, I've, yeah I, I've never, I've never had a, never had a problem with it at all. In fact, uh, yeah. I thought that you know sonically it's fabulous, mm-hmm. and yeah, uh, and I had no problem with the the various you know quote unquote mashups that were done of of certain songs. I thought the combinations were done extremely well by Giles Martin and you know whatever input uh, Sir George had. You know they're they're they were just fabulous yeah the funny thing is um yeah you know I, I interviewed giles at the time and um giles and george martin were both saying you know well you know the hardcore fans are going to be upset at this and the funny thing is that the hardcore fans were already doing their own mashups mm-hmm. uh, there's yeah. a, this beatles remixers group you may know that put out like eight discs worth of beatles <laughs> mashups <laughs> all right which some of which are great, and some of and and in fact, when I went to the interview, I, I said, you know, no, in fact, the hardcore guys are not upset about it. Here's a disc of I, I chose some of the ones I like best and put them on a disc for him, and uh, and handed it to him. My feeling at the time was that um, I kind of was against the whole love show idea. You know, it seemed to me that at the, at the time when the Beatles had not yet put out the remastered albums and there was always, of course, more unreleased stuff to put out, that what they were focusing on was a site-specific show in Las Vegas and, mm. you know, who cares? And so I had actually refused to go out there and have a look at it when I was supposed to be writing about it for the Times. I said, no, I'm just going to write an opinion piece. And the opinion piece is like, why are you wasting your time on this when you've got all this other stuff to do? And they said, well, if Giles is in New York and would you be willing to meet him in a recording studio and he'll have his hard drive with him so that, you know, he can play you the music from the show? And I said, yeah, absolutely. I'm not going to say no to that, right? So I went to a studio in Times Square, and Giles had his hard drive, and he played the mixes on the studio surround system. And, oh, man, they sounded mm. incredible. I mean, yeah. more incredible than they sound on the disc because, you know, this is like high high definition right off the sound drive i mean mm. on, on something you know ken talks about the guitar solo you could hear the pick on the strings you know it just was mm. so incredible mm. and at one point after i wrote my piece um you know my editor said yeah you know it's this, this is really good and the you know the description of the music is good but is there any can you describe it any more what you're feeling about it was any more fully and i said um yeah, sure. It was the best time I've had while fully clothed. And she said, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> so she didn't. <laughs> but uh, but really, it was like that. You know, it was just an incredible experience listening to that stuff in the studio. Mm. Mm. Naturally, I tried to persuade Giles that he should put, you know, out, out more of these sort of unedited tapes. But did he listen to me? Not really. Did you did you try and sneak a recording of him while you were sitting there? 
No, no, that wouldn't have that wouldn't have worked. I don't think. Um, <laughs> I actually would have. I was trying to figure out a way to copy the hard drive, but oh, you know, okay. no, way, no way you could do that, really. Uh, I wasn't really prepared. Um, but, okay. Yeah. Well, I've, I've always enjoyed it. I mean, I don't mm-hmm. go to it that regularly, but I just noticed the talent that it takes to mix songs together that work well. And mm-hmm. you've got to have an ear for that. You know, I've yep. heard a lot of mashups that sound like crap. Just throwing yeah. any two songs mm-hmm. together or three songs together where they just don't work. And yeah. I'm sure that there's a lot of Beatles songs you could do that with together that won't work. But these do. You know, and I especially love the one that used um, what you're doing with the word. Um, mm-hmm. you know, it, just, it just seemed to flow. You know, and uh, it, it's not easy to do that, to have a mind to know what songs blend well together. That's the art of doing this. <laughs> Right. So, um, you know, I don't know if overall I look at this more as a novelty, because this is mm-hmm. not the way the Beatles themselves envisioned the song. But yeah. it's just more a producer's, you know, dream job <laughs> of mixing yeah. things together and coming up with something entirely new and fresh and a different yeah. way of hearing it. So, you know, I enjoy it from that perspective. Yeah. I don't think I could ever listen to it as a, on a regular basis like I would Beatles music or, or solo music, you know. Yeah. That within you, without you, uh, uh, yes. tomorrow, tomorrow never knows. Never knows. It's, it's yeah, that absolutely astound- astounding. That is just, mm-hmm. if, if nothing else on that album gets you, that has to. That yeah. has to. Well, yeah. the, 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 the only other one that would really, really get you is the, uh, the, the demo of While My Guitar Gently Weeps with right. the George oh, yeah. Martin orchestration. That mm. is, that's, that. That's a, yeah. a, chi- a chiller. Let's put it that well, way. Well, when you see it live in the show, if you're not, if you yeah. don't have tears in your eyes, yeah, uh, as we did, and that part is just, it, oh God, it's it's it gives you goosebumps just to think about it. Mm-hmm. It's incredible. So Ken, this week you saw both Ringo and James McCartney in concert. Can you give us a, a wrap up of of those two performances? Oh, yeah. Well, the Ringo show was like the other show that I saw in Port at the Capitol Theater. The one that I just saw was in Staten Island at the St. George's Theater, which I understand, by the way, one of my listeners got to see Help when it premiered there in 1965. So that theater's been around for a long time. But uh, the thing that I loved about the show in Staten Island, first of all, there was not any empty seats that I saw anywhere. It was packed. There And mm-hmm. it seemed like the crowd was much more into it, especially on the songs that jammed, the Santana songs and the Toto songs. So I, yeah. really, I really, you know, feed off of that when I see the audience really into it, much more so, I think, than the show in Porchester. But I do love seeing the, the guest appearances. Chasm Sultan came on at the end. He played acoustic guitar and sang on With a Little Help from My Friends. Um, and also Billy Amendola came on stage, too. And for those of you that don't know... Either Billy mm. or, or Chasm. Chasm, by the way, uh, Todd Rundgren fans know who he is because he's worked with Todd for many years on his solo albums, and he was in part of he was one of the members of Utopia as well. Um, he's a great musician all around. He just played acoustic guitar on this, and Billy Amendola has been around since the '70s. He was in a funk band called Mantis, and <laughs> they had uh, a few dance hits. And he's been a session drummer, and he's an editor for Modern Drummer. And he got to go on stage for with a little help of my friends, too, and play tambourine and sing along. I'm always happy when someone that I know gets to go on stage and join Ringo. It's like, you know, this is the highlight of their lives for some of these people. Sure. The brilliant thing that- about ending the show with a song like with a little help from my friends is you can invite anybody on. <laughs> you don't have to rehearse the song. Everybody can sing along with it. And, you know, most people who are musicians that play an instrument can probably play the chords anyway. So... Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, but it's always an enjoyable show, and for me, as much as I love seeing the performance, I love seeing the audience reaction, especially people that you know, some of them are going there for the first time seeing Ringo and the All-Stars. So yep. I really love seeing their reaction and how much they really enjoy it. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, James McCartney, I've seen now three times in concert, just saw him in Hamden, Connecticut, to an audience of about 30 people in a mm-hmm. very small club, and I thought that he was really great. Uh, the only thing is that it was him alone. Most of the time he played an electric guitar plugged into an amp, and that was it. Mm. 
and he played songs from his new album called The Blackberry Train. I really like the album more and more as I'm listening to it. And James is a very good musician, and I've seen him play guitar, piano, but most of all, I'm impressed not only with his songwriting, but with his singing. He's got a dynamite voice, a powerful voice, and he can sing in a high register, too. And uh, I think the songs really sound great alone, but at this point, whenever I've seen James, it's been with him alone. And I would like to get a full band treatment. Um, you know, I could say one thing about James as I could about the other Beatles sons that I admire so much is that they're not living off their name. Um, you know, James McCartney probably, if he asked his father, could open for him on tour. But he's mm -hmm. going this route instead. He's playing small mm -hmm. clubs. You know, he's learning the ropes. And uh, I am impressed with the music, most of all, because I think he has a lot of potential. And a lot of this stuff I can easily hear on the radio, on uh, the AAA radio, that format. And you can definitely tell, certainly from his new album, The Blackberry Train, very influenced by Nirvana, has a very raw 90s sound, very edgy, but melodic, kind of like Nirvana. So I definitely get that feeling when I listen to the new album. And I'm impressed with him as a performer. So we okay. would like to see him expand and, and have a full band, though. Yeah, I mean, the, the stuff on the new album suggests that, you know, a band would be in order. Yeah, definitely. He and, Mc, he and McCartney played uh, a festival in, I believe, in San Francisco, and they did, and they played on separate days, and they did not play, so they did not play with each other. Hmm. So they are not, it, so, I mean, it, that would have been an opportunity for him to cash in a lot on his dad's name, and he did not. So mm -hmm. he doesn't do that at all. Okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. So we also have on this week's list of things to talk about um, the anniversary of one of the great, most rubbishy releases ever to come out <laughs> related, <laughs> related to the Beatles. And which of you wants to take that one? I guess I'll take it because I was the uh, <laughs> I was the one who came up with this little nugget uh, when I do my my morning almanac -y posts that I put on Twitter and, and Facebook, I happened to come up with the, uh, the nugget that it was this week, 35 years ago, that <sighs> Stars on 45 yeah. became the number one record in the U.S., and I immediately thought of Ken. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> because Ken is like Ken is the the opposite the 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 opposite Mikey you know Mikey from the what was it the Life serial you know you know let's give it to Mikey he hates everything well yeah. Ken Ken likes everything that's, <laughs> his that's his taste really, that's really well, not you're, true well you your know? tastes are your tastes are let's put it this way and I, and I mean this in a good way uh -huh. your tastes are much more shall we say liberal than a lot of us who are have particular biases against particular musical genres like disco. disco. Uh huh. Uh -huh. And that would be that would be me, for instance. <laughs> yes, and me too. And in fact, uh, I hadn't heard Stars on 45 in a very long time until I posted it this morning, and I learned all over again why I hated that record. <laughs> But so 35 years and time couldn't fly fast enough. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I just, happen I to just... really like that record a lot. <laughs> I just we, threw we, it off all you want, but it went to number one. So evidently I'm not alone in this world. Oh, no, yes, absolutely it's not. It's true. Yes. I, like, I like it, too. I just threw in a couple of notes there. I guess you guys missed it. You were all talking. I just threw that in just for fun so that we'd all laugh a little bit. But I love I love Stars in 45. I always have loved it. So There you go. I'm I'm a fan. I'm I'm a, I'm definitely a fan. Now the thing mm. is, I really think that record was well executed for what it what what its intention was. And you're dealing with a time when medleys were a craze. It was a fad for a while. And those songs, those particular Beatles songs with a disco beat, really just they they blended together extremely well. And the way to do that effectively, and it's much easier to do this, is to have the same beat in the background as opposed to taking the Beatles recordings that could be at separate tempos, different tempos, and they may not mesh together as well. 
you know, in fact, one of uh, one of our Facebook friends sent me a link to something just like that, using the same songs that Stars on 45 did, but using the Beatles recordings. And it worked somewhat, but it didn't flow <laughs> nearly as well. But the thing also that I like to keep in mind when something like that comes out is that any time there's anything that's related to the Beatles that does well, I think it benefits the Beatles, too. Because a lot of young people heard mm. those songs and probably thought, what's this song, No Reply? I like this. Where can I find this? You know, it could have led to people investigating, young people investigating the Beatles catalog. So I feel that way whenever somebody covers a Beatles song in particular, where mm -hmm. fans want to investigate the original recording. But I just think that, you know, that was a time when the medleys were the craze. And... I will say, and I hate to always make comparisons, but when the Beatles movie medley came out, I hated it. I completely mm -hmm. hated it because as someone who's probably tougher on himself, more critical of himself than anyone that you ever know, when I first heard the Beatles movie medley, I was in college, I was studying communications and radio, I was doing production work, I was doing a lot of editing. And even at that early stage, I could have done a better job doing a movie medley on the Beatles than Capitol Records did. So I much rather prefer here Stars on 45 than the Beatles movie medley. There were a whole oh. bunch of other medleys that came out at that time. The Beach Boys, Supremes, Credence. You know, it was just, you know, hooked on at that time. Yeah. Hooked on classics. Right. There yeah. Was, now, Alan, right. Alan's, I'm sure one of Alan's all time favorite. Oh yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, I, I, I think <laughs> that you're making you're 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 giving them a little too much credit because at the time when those things came out, there really wasn't the you know, the urge of trying to get people into the Beatles catalog. It was really more of a commercial thing. I mean yeah. Star from forty five also did an ABBA tribute. Mm -hmm. I mean do you want me to play a little of that? No, no, um, no. No, th no, thank you. <laughs> but I mean, I'm not I saying mean, that Stars on 45 did this so that it would increase interest in the Beatles. I'm just saying that was a byproduct of it. You know, yeah, they just wanted to have yeah. a hit record. That's all they wanted to do. And well, they were yeah. successful at it. So it exposed a lot of people, who, a lot of young people, who may not have known the Beatles songs to these songs first. I mm. thought it was, I, I think it was completely commercial. Uh, com a commercial enterprise, nothing more to sell records, and they did it, and they did a, a nice job, and they made a. You you're know, not, you're a, not getting the point here. Well, <laughs> I'm not saying they did this so that it could help Beatle records. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying that the nature of the fact that it was a huge hit probably led some young people to investigate the Beatles' music, and that's right. a good thing. Doesn't matter how they get to the music, as long as they get there. I think you're comparing then and now, and that was a different era. It was a different time, a lot different time. And I think, so, see, what, I think what he's saying is that if they listened to that record and their mind hadn't been completely numbed by the yes. stupid disco beat, right. they might have had a thought, and that thought might have been, what's one of those tunes, let's go mm -hmm. see the original is. But, you know, there were so many, so many things sort of militating against that because the the – record itself was so well oh, never yeah. you know, well it, 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 repre was. it represented the that kind of producer driven uh generic you know disco dreck you know the kind of the you know the kind of of cynicism that produced frank sinatra doing a disco version of night and day that produced ethel merman doing a disco version of there's no business like show business oh, you, you have to hear that that is oh. i have I have that. TV. That stuff is absolutely is brutal. I mean, that stuff should be uh, should be played for uh, you know terrorism uh, prisoners. I mean, that was and and the, that's the problem. That's probably the biggest problem that I had with most disco. I mean, the good stuff, the Donna Summer records, the the Niles Rogers, Bernard Edwards productions, things like that, uh, the Village People. So mm. Those were I great. I never liked the Village People myself. But. Yeah, but they were they were great they were, pop they were novelty. They, they were, were great novelty. pop. They were great pop records. How about, the, how about the Beach Boys going disco? Remember that? 
Well, that, that 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 was that didn't that that is probably in that same vein of right. uh, you know of you know why why do this, yeah. but there were but so much of what else was out there were basically just these producers cranking out this this crapola to you know which was just it was made mm-hmm. to be disposable and most of it uh, and most of it was disposable. Mm-hmm. No, I, 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 so, I yeah. and, I've and so many times there's no way I'm ever going to say anything to change the way you feel about this. I just think that as a pop record, it worked for what they, the way that it was executed. It was a fun record, nothing mm-hmm. more, not some great artistic statement here, but as mm-hmm. a medley, these songs were strung together well, and I applaud them for it. And evidently, enough people liked it to make it number one. This is true. So there you go. You know. yeah. So there is apparently one other anniversary that only Ken is aware of, but we're all probably going to say, "Oh yeah," when he tells us. So oh, Ken, yeah, we're all aware mm. of it, and actually we're what a few weeks late on it. But I just want to take on something because okay. mm-hmm. um, just recently it was the 50th anniversary of the single of Paperback Writer coming out. Oh, okay. So sure. what I wanted to ask the three of you is, whenever you read about Paperback Writer now, they make this, you know, very big deal about the fact that there was more bass presence coming from Paul on the record. And, you know, the Beatles, from everything that I read, they certainly listened to a lot of American records, and they heard what was on R&B records and Motown, and they heard there was more bass, so they wanted more bass. Mm -hmm. So what I wanted to know, since the three of you are somewhat older than me, when the record (coughs) first came out... Watch it, watch it. (laughs) When that record first came out and you heard it on the radio, did you automatically think, wow, listen to that bass? Was it that noticeable at that time? No. no I didn't. Absolutely not. You, you know, I said it, listen to that echo. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's true. But the, song, but the song I always said, listen to that bass, was getting, uh, uh, getting better because I used to, I used to uh, sit there and, and, and play air bass to him doing that with the when he used to uh, stride down the the neck of the, the guitar um, because I, I love the way he played that you know mm-hmm. the do 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 I, I love that I thought that was great but no not paperback writer not at no, all was, you know because especially if you heard it on uh, you know uh, being from New York on WABC or WMCA uh-huh. Uh-huh. the yes. sound the sound wasn't good enough that you'd yeah. be listening for the uh, you know for the bass playing right you know okay. it was just it yeah, was maybe just when we got the single home you know yeah but i i don't remember being especially taken by it but no. you know and it's it's Not hard to tell because we've heard it so much more That's, recently you know yeah. and, and it was one of the issues in the the one mixes you know the mono versus stereo and then uh-huh. the, the one mix that sort of took the mono characteristics which was you know the had a lot of the bass uh but um yeah, uh, or I think the stereo actually had the bass too much. Wasn't that the problem? It was, I think that's it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, and it was more integrated in the in the one mix. Um, right. But yeah, I mean, it's an it's an incredible bass line. It comes spilling right from the top. Mm-hmm. Down, you know. But the 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 main thing I remember was that intro, that sort of choral yeah. intro they do, and then the echo at the end of it. I mean, that was sort of a, a mm-hmm. big effect. Uh, and the other thing I remember about it was the granny glasses when they performed it on the Ed yeah. Sullivan show. <laughs> the ne- the yep. next day, every single one of us went to school and found a candy store that sold granny glasses and uh-huh. walked around in granny glasses the rest of the summer, you know? Yeah. <laughs> or until well, they and broke. Also, and also the chip in Paul's teeth. Mm. Right. Yeah. No, but you know, when you do read about Paperback Rider now, they always bring that up about mm-hmm. the bass sound how they wanted more of a bass presence. So I thought the three of you being exposed to it when it came out and hearing it on the radio, I just wanted to know how you felt when you heard it. But to me, no. you know, I hear more bass in rain than I do in, in paperback. Oh, yeah. Mm. yeah. So, um, you know, just wanted to get your, you guys your, your takes on this. So, well, that was a, uh, we had a, quite a list of things to get through, and I think we got through them all, and uh, we could probably still be talking about any one of them, but uh, thanks, guys, and uh, so f- I guess we should talk about how to get in touch with us, which is 
on Twitter at sign things we said fab. Yay! And you got you it. You can yeah. Well, have, have it's somebody's sloppy hand rotor. Uh, <laughs> if we <laughs> you can email us at things we said today radio show at gmail dot com. We love hearing from you. We um, often respond. Um, if you have ideas for things that you'd like us to cover, uh, mm-hmm. please feel free to let us know. There's you know millions of topics out there, and uh, you may be thinking of some of them we haven't thought of. And uh, otherwise, getting in touch with everyone individually. Uh, for me, you can just get me on Facebook under Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed. Um, Steve? Uh, Beatles Examiner at gmail.com. I'm on Facebook under my own name, and I have a, a Beatles news group called uh, Beatles News and Commentary. We also have a, a group for the show called Things We... There's actually two groups. There's one for the show and one for the Fab Four radio broadcast, but either one, uh, you're welcome to join, and we will talk about uh, the show there. Okay, and Al? Uh, on Facebook, Al Sussman. On uh, Twitter, at ASUSS49, or through Beetle Fan Magazine at www.beetlefan.com. And last but not least, Ken, what are you giving away this week? Um, the remastered Stars on 45 album from 1981. <laughs> Ooh, what kind of questions do I have to answer? To- <laughs> with, the, with the full is this, minute is version? This yes. Is this on Blu-ray? <laughs> but uh, actually, I am giving away Pure McCartney on my, on my website. And that's at KenMichaelsRadio.com. And like I said before, if you would like to check out my interview with Henry McCulloch, it's on the home page. If you scroll all the way down, it's right underneath, ironically, an interview with uh, Denny Sywell and Peter Asher right there. You can also email me at everylittlething at att.net. And my Facebook page is right there under Ken Michaels. There's a photo of me with Todd Rundgren. So, uh... Yeah. Again, the website's KenMichaelsRadio.com. And so for Ken, Al, and Steve, and things we said today, I'm Alan Cozen, and we'll see you next time. Mm-hmm.